Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. For those who don't know me, my name is John, uh, one of the pastors here. And to clarify Jason's uh, comment about my accent, it is a little bit strange. Uh, if you don't know, I was born in New Zealand, moved here when I was five, five moved to Hawaii when I was 18, uh, spent about a year and a half in Norway, and then moved back here when I was 36. So it, that's my accent. If you are wondering, it's all over the place. I don't even know what it is myself. Um, but that's Jimmy up on the screen. So it's becoming Sunday. It's one of, uh, I think it's our fourth Becoming Sunday we've done this year. Um, Jimmy, I saw that video on Thursday afternoon. Uh, James Casina showed me it and said, what do you think? And I th- said, this is great. I'd love to meet this guy. And then I went home and I spoke to Michael Hands, our senior pastor. And I said, hey, I just saw that video of Jimmy up in Brisbane. He seems like such a, a great guy. He said, oh yeah, he's coming over your house for dinner tonight. I said, he is? I had no idea, but our house is always open, our table's always set, so I got to meet Jimmy on uh, Thursday night and uh, hear a little bit more of that story. But it's just so neat to hear um, a, a lot of the stories and testimonies that are coming out of uh, so many of us who are reading through the Bible this year. Um, so as I mentioned, it is Becoming Sunday, which I'll share a little bit more about soon, but it's one of, uh, it's one of those special Sundays we do in the year to just kind of realign as a church. Um, um, every year, at most of most churches around the country, ours included, we have what we call a Vision Sunday. So generally for our church, we do this in February and we announce to the church what we sense God is going to do in and through our community for the year. It could be a new church plant, maybe launching a new ministries. It might be an overseas missions projects. And these have been uh, just amazing in the last 20 plus years of new life history And we've seen God just do incredible things that so many of you have been a part of. And just these God-honoring stories that have come out of these different Vision Sundays. But for 2021, as a church, we thought, you know, what? rather than doing just one, why don't we look at doing four of these Vision Sundays? So these are known as our Becoming Sundays. And it's like, let's grab a time out, let's get our drink bottles, let's huddle together, get refocused, and get the vision again, and then launch back out onto the field. And so as we sought the Lord for 2021, a word that came to us as a church was, rather than just launch with something to do or achieve, why don't we start this year with a question? And the question was, who are you becoming in 2021? Who are you becoming in 2021? And we challenged everyone that calls New Life Home to read through the Bible throughout this whole year of 2021. And we just, as I said before, and what we saw up there on the screen, we've just been hearing some incredible stories and testimonies. I've been hearing them in my own small group, how uh, God is just shaping people's lives and transforming people's lives as they read through His Word. The reality is, we are all becoming someone. All of, us, all of us every day, we're making decisions, we're creating habits, we're, we're forming friendships, and they are forming us, and at times, transforming us. And the question is, into who? Unto what? Uh, maybe another way we could frame it this morning is, are the decisions we're making today leading us to become more like Christ Tomorrow, Are the decisions we're making today leading us to become more like Christ tomorrow? So today on this Becoming Sunday, I want to look at this question through the lens of Matthew 18, where Jesus calls us to become like little children. So hopefully we're going to have a bit of fun today. We're going to be talking about kids and stuff. So hopefully we should have a fun morning. I love kids. Uh, God has blessed Ellen and myself with four of them. Our house is just chaotic and crazy and messy at times. It's loud and busy, but it is also a lot of fun. I just consider it one of the biggest privileges in life to be able to uh, raise these four little children. Something I'll hear almost every single day from one of my kids is, hey, Dad, when I get older, I want to be. And then they'll tell me what they want to be. Some of you guys can probably relate if you have children. So I'll be driving to school and my little guy, Sam, 
Samuel, he'll, he'll see a fire truck and he'll say, hey dad, when I get older, I want to be a fireman. And then the next day we'll, we'll be driving to school, he sees a plane. Hey dad, 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 when I get older, I know what I want to be. I want to be a pilot. About a week ago, my uh, oldest daughter, her name is Matea, she uh, came into our room and she has her iPad and she had opened up Google Maps on the iPad. So my wife, Ellen, she's from southern Norway, right up in, uh, in Scandinavia. And so uh, she had found Norway uh, at 12 years old on Google Maps and she had zoomed into the southern part of Norway where uh, Ellen's parents still have a farm. And it's this beautiful farm. It's literally surrounded by strawberry fields. So when we're over there in the summer. We can eat as many strawberries as we want, and we eat bucket loads every single day. It also overlooks the ocean. And so she had zoomed in on this farm, and she said, hey, Dad, when I get older, I'm going to build a house right here. She actually had the, like, the location. And over here is where my barn is going to go, and over here is where I'm going to have my, my stables, and this is where I'm going to put all my horses. She had the, the whole thing mapped out. I find it interesting When we're young, we're often dreaming about what we want to be when we're older. But now that I'm older, sometimes I find myself wishing I was younger. So um, in March, I I, I turned 40. And I, I got to admit, there was this like, oh my gosh, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. So I'm kind of trying to think, okay, what can I do to make myself feel a bit younger when I turn 40? So my wife didn't want me to buy a motorcycle. She said that's just too expensive for a midlife crisis. Figure something else out. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to be the fittest I've ever been in my life by the time I turn 40. I called it Fitter by 40. And so I thought, okay, every day for the next few months, I'm going to drink a green smoothie a day. All our staff see me taking my green smoothie in every morning to work, and then a a red smoothie every night with berries, and then I'm going to start training to run 40 kilometers on my 40th birthday. I'm going to be the fittest I've ever been by 40. So I start training and doing this whole thing, and then one night I'm on, it's like nine o'clock at night, I'm on the treadmill, I'm trying to get all the Ks under my feet, and I have this moment, I don't even like running. Why am I doing this? So I thought, you know what, I'm not going to do 40K, I'll do 21K. I mean, if I can do 21K when I'm 40, that's pretty fit, right? So I started training for 21K. Then it came to my 40th birthday, I'm ready to go. And I'm proud to say I ran 10K on my 40th birthday, and I still felt pretty fit. I'm like, hey, I can still keep up with the kids, and that that was cheaper than buying a motorbike. So anyway, growing up and maturing is a part of life. And something I believe, even though I can try to fight against it sometimes, is something we should not just embrace, but welcome and enjoy. However, it's interesting when we we start reading through the Word and through the Scriptures, Jesus points out when it comes to our faith, we need to become more like children, have faith like a child. It's like in one lane, we're, we're, we're growing and we're maturing and we're getting wiser and we're, we're hopefully making better decisions. But then in this other lane, Jesus is saying we need to become more like children, become more childlike. In the book of Matthew, we're confronted with this story, which many of you would know well in, in Matthew 19, where some parents, they're, they're with their children And they spot Jesus and they're like, we want to take our children over to Jesus and and get him to bless our children. So the parents take their kids over and then the disciples see what's happening. And so the disciples jump in thinking, uh, you know, Jesus is way too important for these kids. And they try to stop the whole thing. And then some famous words we we read by Jesus, uh, which many of you would know. He says, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus loved kids. And in Matthew 18, he uses a child as an example for what our faith should look like. Matthew 18, 1 to 5, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Therefore, whoever takes a lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So what's going on here? What's the, the, the context of all of this? So Jesus, if we were to go back a couple of chapters, Jesus in the, the previous chapters had been telling the disciples everything we know is normal is about to change. Everything that we're doing before, everything's going to look different. I'm actually going to be betrayed. I'm going to be tortured. And then eventually I'm going to be crucified. And, and then and on the third day I'm going to rise again. So, so these are the conversations, you can, if you can just picture that for a minute, that Jesus is having with his disciples. And if I could picture myself in that scene, I could imagine the mood must have been pretty sobering. It just quiet, what do you mean, Jesus? What, what, do you really mean this is going to happen? And, and then as, as I picture the mood, some, you know, someone blurts out as we read in Scripture, hey, Jesus, one of the disciples says, when all of this happens... When this goes down, who's going to be on the top seat? I mean, who's going to be the greatest amongst us? Who's going to be on center stage? Now, if you look at the circumstances, if you, if you picture that situation and what's going on, that's a pretty insensitive thing to say in that moment. I mean, Jesus is pouring out his heart. He's saying to his disciples, I'm about to take on the sin of the world. I mean, I, I, things are about to get crazy right now. And then as he's saying that, one of the disciples, well, who's going to be number one when you go? It's interesting, or I find it interesting at least, when you dwell on this scripture, I think it reveals something about the reality of the human heart. For most of us, there is this desire, you know, to get on top to win, to succeed. And that can be really healthy, but it can also become really unhealthy. And I think in this passage of Scripture, it's clearly unhealthy. And what Jesus does in, in, in answering it, he actually, uh, I love this part, he bypasses the whole question. He does something completely unexpected. Rather than answering the question, he sees this little kid walking by. He calls out to the little kid, hey, come over here for a minute. The little child walks over to Jesus and uh, Jesus sits him down in the middle of them. And he says to his disciples, you want to be the greatest? Well, then you need to become like this little child, humbling yourself and being childlike. So today, I wanted to look at three thoughts about how we can be more like little children in our faith. So the first point is a childlike faith is curious. If we were, we won't do it, but if we were to do it, if we were to all leave the auditorium right now, go out into the courtyard, there's about a hundred kids over there in Kids Life with all their amazing leaders. And if we were to go in, just kind of peer through the windows and just observe what is happening, what would we see? First, it'd be crazy, it would be loud, there's kids running around everywhere, it's a bit of a chaotic scene. But if we really watched and observed, and we look, looked at the children, what would we notice? A sense of awe, a sense of wonder, excitement, just this, this natural curiosity that children have in life. It's like when I watch my own kids play, and, and for those who are parents, you, you'll be able to relate to this. It's almost like I rediscover the simple pleasures in life when I see it through the lens of my children. And I believe what Jesus is saying here in this verse in Matthew is always maintain a childlike faith. He's not saying be childish or immature, but childlike curious, excited, not overcomplicating things. And I love this about new believers. They have this natural childlike faith. They're so excited about their faith. They're sharing it with anyone that will listen. They have this hunger for the Word. And it's all new to them. This is awe and wonder about following Christ and letting Him transform their lives. Some of you can relate when you first became believers. 
about 20 years ago when I was living in Hawaii, um, one of my friends, his name was Davidson, he gave his life to the Lord. Um, to to uh, the, paint the picture here, uh, everything Davidson had done pretty much up to that point of giving his life to the Lord was illegal. He, 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 was, uh, he was pretty rough, you'd say. Uh, even on his face, he had quite a few scars because of all the fights he had been in. But he had this uh, radical salvation and gave his heart to the Lord. And he said to me, he's like, hey, John, you've, you've been doing this for a while would you consider maybe discipling me and just helping me explore this, this new faith that I had have? And I said, absolutely, Davidson, I'd love to do that. So we started meeting once a week, and we would read through the Scripture together, and we would be praying and, and just uh, spending time, and I'd be discipling him. And it was so fun for me to see this new believer opening up the Scriptures for the first time in this curiosity he had, just this desire to learn and to become more like Christ. It was interesting. I was, um, we're going through uh, uh, Matthew 28, I believe, and the, the Great Commission, and we're talking about how God calls all of us who are believers to, to share our faith and to reach out to others. And, and sometimes He'll give us a heart for, for certain people. And Davidson said, well, John, you know, there's, there's a, a massive homelessness problem in this little town that we're living in in Hawaii, the, the town was called Kona. And he said, every time I'm driving through Kona, I, I see all these homeless people and I see the lack of hope that they have. I, I see the, the mental health crisis that they're going through, just the poverty that they're living in. And he said, every time I go through the streets of Kona and I'm driving my car, there's just, there's just something that tugs on my heart that maybe this hope that I have, I should be also sharing it with them. And he said, do, do you think that might be the Lord? I said, oh, I don't know, Davidson, but it kind of sounds like it might be. And so he, over the next few weeks, he would spend his evenings and, and weekends, and he'd just start ministering and just spending time with this homeless community there in Kona. I remember one day we're, we're meeting and we're going through the Word again. He said, hey, John, I've got to stop you for a minute. This, this might sound crazy, but you, you know how I've been reaching out to the homeless people, and I'm just building the most beautiful relationships. But you know what? I'm still an outsider. I don't, you know, I connect, but I'm not really connecting. They don't really relate to me because, you know, I live in my apartment and I've got a job and everything. He said, you know, as we read through the Bible, I see what Jesus did and Jesus came to earth for us, you know. And, and so I'm wondering, what if I was to become homeless? Do you think I'd be able to, you, you know, reach out to them in a greater way? Straight away, I had a hundred reasons why that was a terrible idea, the, you know, the danger and everything else. But I felt that just that small, quiet voice saying, no, John, just let him, just let him explain this to you. Anyway, long story short, two weeks later, Davidson locked up his apartment. He actually, I was there the first day where, where he went homeless. He showed me his bag. He had uh, an extra pair of shorts, t-shirt, and a towel, and that was it. He continued working his regular job, and then the evenings and, and, and uh, on the weekends, he would literally sleep on the street with the homeless. He used all of his money he made during the two months he did it to take them out for the fanciest meals you could possibly ever have in Hawaii. But I remember just watching him, and the stories that came out of that time of Davidson, those, those eight weeks of him living on the street, I could, I could fill a book. It was inspiring, but it was also unbelievably challenging. And, and why? Why am I telling you this story? I think for me, as someone who'd been walking with the Lord for longer, I was incredibly challenged by this young believer, also incredibly inspired to live out my own calling with this greater sense of purpose. And I think it's so important for those of us who have been believers for a long time to be spending time with those who are younger in their faith, to catch some of their, their fire, their excitement, their perspective. And then for those who are younger in their faith, it's also equally important that they're spending time with those who are more mature in their faith. Because following Christ, and many of you know this, through the different seasons in life, the highs and lows, the consistent time in the Word, living prayerfully, it develops a depth in someone that can only come with time. And, and so that's why we need each other. And that's what discipleship is, young believers and mature believers. And that's what I, I love about the church. This is what I love about our church. We have all generations, physically and spiritually, and we all 
need each other. We have people who have been walking with Christ for 50 years, and then we have people who have been walking with Christ for just a few days. The fact is we all need to mature, and we all need to grow in our faith. And Paul points this out in Ephesians 4.14. He says uh, we, we need to mature. We can't be tossed around like the winds and the waves in, in what we believe. But then Jesus also points out we still need to be childlike, to stay curious in our faith. The second point is a childlike faith is humble. I was picturing the moment when Jesus said, you need to become more like little children to his disciples. He said, you remember, uh, do, oh sorry, do you remember what they were arguing about? When he said, I want you to become more like children. What were they arguing about? Greatness. Who would be the best? Who would be in front? Who's going to be number one? So Jesus, he brings this child to them to answer the question. What was the answer? Humility. Matthew 18, 4 says, Therefore, whoever takes a lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying that we need to have the humility of a child. Uh, I've got a, a 10-month-old. I actually could hear her crying out there just earlier because she's got a set of lungs that are just incredible. And uh, she understands that she needs her parents. When she's in her cot uh, in the morning, I love it, I'll walk in there. And she'll just have her arms up, and I'll go and pick her up. When she hurts herself, which is multiple times a day with all her siblings, uh, she'll cry. And we'll go over there, and we were, will comfort her. When she's hungry, we'll chop up food. And uh, her favorite thing is sushi right now. Believe it or not, I make these tiny little sushi rolls for her. And she'll eat. I'll, we'll feed her. Uh, we put her to bed. We, we change her nappies. We, we bath her. And she's very dependent upon Ellen and I as her parents. And I believe Jesus is saying, as a child is happily dependent on their parent, so you should also be dependent on me. So the answer to your question, he says to the disciples, the pathway to greatness is actually to become more like a child. The way to be strong is to recognize your weakness. The way to be great is to be humble. In John 10, 27 to 28, Jesus says, My sheep, listen to my voice. The sheep being us, which is kind of humbling in itself being referred to as a sheep. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. In this text, Follow translates to complies with instruction. And I believe there is this, this shift that happens when we come to realize that God's plan for us is better than the plan we may have for ourselves. And when he leads us to something that we don't want to be led to, it's for our ultimate good. For many of us, myself included, that means humbling ourselves and saying, you are God and I am not. You are in control and I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to put my trust in you. And that brings me to my, my final point this morning. A childlike faith is trusting. Proverbs 3.5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. I went back and forth if I should share this next story with you. Um, actually, just a few nights ago, I was, uh, I, was, I was with my wife, Ellen, and I said, can I just read you this? I, I, I don't know if I should share it. And so I read it to her, and she's like, you know what, John? You know, the, the church is, this is our family, and we need to be open with our family. She said, I think you should share it. A little over two weeks ago, we lost a very, very dear family member, our sister in, Nor a sister in law in Norway, uh, Annalena, she passed away, 40 years old, um, and it went way quicker than we ever, ever could have expected. Uh, same age as me. I remember we got the news early Thursday morning that things were not looking good. It was so hard for us to believe. Four days before that, so th literally three weeks ago today, she was out hiking with her family. We're getting pictures, and she looks so well. Woke up the next morning with a headache and went into hospital, and four days later, she passed away. 
So we get the news she's not doing well, and the family's being called to the hospital. We, we feel unbelievably separated being on the other side of the world. I'm driving my kids to school that morning, uh, my three oldest ones to Hillcrest over in Madruba, and I tell them that your auntie is really sick right now. She's actually in a hospital. I'm like, really, Dad? She was just hiking a few days ago. I'm like, I know, but she's, she's not doing well right now. And they could tell it was serious because I had tears in my eyes. And uh, they responded and they said, well, Dad, let's pray for a miracle. And I'm just holding the steering wheel, just doing whatever I could to hold it together. And one by one, ages 12, 9, and, and 5, they started praying for a miracle for their auntie who was in hospital and unconscious in Norway. I remember after I dropped them off, I pulled the car over and I was almost jealous at the faith that my children had. Just this, this, this purity and this, this, this trust. And I was like, oh, I, want, I want some more of that in my own life. That afternoon, Thursday afternoon, we had to tell them that their auntie had passed, that she had died. And I remember myself thinking, what is this going to do to their hearts? They were very close to her. We used to spend every summer over there. What is this going to do to their hearts? But also, what is this going to do to their faith? The last couple of weeks have been filled with questions from them and a lot of tears. I'm filled with a lot of questions. But when it comes to their faith, they've chosen to trust that God is still good that God is still big, that He is present, that He will comfort us, and that Annalena is with Jesus and will also be one day. To be really honest with you, church, part of me the last couple of weeks have wanted to just say they're just, they're just children. They're just naive. But then I get a glimpse into their perspective and their truth and realize this is a faith that I need more of in my own life. A childlike faith. So in closing, growing up, growing old is mandatory. But growing up is optional. Today we looked at three areas of a childlike faith. And, and as we close, I wanted to just ask us again as a church, ask myself, who are we becoming in 2021? And does that look more like Jesus? When it comes to having faith like a child, what, God, what, what might God be speaking to you? Is it to be more curious? Maybe it's stopping to watch a sunset and just, just taking it in. Maybe it's going for a walk at night and seeing the, the, the beauty of the stars and just being in awe of God's creation. Maybe it's opening the Word and, and, and having curious eyes and saying, God, I want you to reveal yourself to me in ways you've never done before. Is it humbling yourself before God to recognize your own weakness and that it's okay if we don't have it all together, that's okay. But knowing that we can find our hope and strength in Him. Or maybe it's my journey. Is it, is it, is it to trust Him more? And even though we might not always understand, choosing to place our trust in Him in all areas of our lives. Trusting that He is God and that He loves His children. And it's okay if it doesn't always make sense. The decisions we make today determine who we become tomorrow. So what might God be saying to you? How do you need to become more like a child in your faith so you can become more like Jesus tomorrow? Can we just stand to our feet as we pray? So Lord, we just thank you for this morning, that we can worship you, that you are present amongst us. And we all came with a story today, 
We all have things that we're working through. And Lord, I just pray to you, you speak to us right now as we finish and close with the song of worship, that you speak to our hearts, that you speak to our, our minds, that you speak to our situations. Lord, help us to become more childlike and more like you. In your name we pray, amen. So we're just going to respond in a song of worship. I just pray that God would just open your hearts to whatever it is He's wanting to do right now in your life this morning.